私を誰だと思っている We already did the Grand Lagan reference last week, lady. We open this week with Yoyo, of course, cooking up the Kira Kira potion that this whole second arc has kind of been built around. It was successfully brewed, though I doubt they'll ever explain why it makes cakes taste good. Mashiro went to tell Sora the good news while she was cheating on her with an older lady. But yeah, Shala ended up waking up thanks to her Sora alarm clock and was told about how her king and queen were going to wake up soon. Um, what was that little pause there for? Uh, you know what, never mind. I'm probably just overthinking things, right? Anyway, they made their way to Skyline, where Miss Barry and Lieutenant Swole were waiting. Seriously, look at this dude. And they used the potion to dispel Batamonda's curse. Feels like I was taken to another world where I piloted a giant mech knight and then was forced to participate in a killing game. The royal couple were happily reunited with their daughter, though I gotta say, I feel a little bad that these parents ended up missing out on their daughter's first words. Like, seriously, while she only started off with calling out to Sora, this toddler has built up quite the decent vocabulary. It kind of reminds you that they did hire a fairly high profile VA for such a minor role that I'm sure will never develop into anything special in the near future. Could I get any heavier foreshadowing? Anyway, news about the Precure successfully awakening the Royals quickly spread, which again is just making me feel a little uneasy with how things are going a little too well for our protagonist. But again, maybe I'm just being paranoid. But yeah, this was going to be kind of relevant to this episode, as the Precure were asked to be a part of a celebratory parade, one in which they'd come in on Birdback. Oh, come on, Masho. We all know that Chocobo are completely harmless. Oh, wait, they're legit enemies in 16, aren't they? Oh, well, been nice knowing you. Also, am I the only one who thinks it's a little awkward to have Tsubasa ride on one of these fowls? It kind of gives me Goofy and Pluto vibes. Anyway, since this episode was written by a secondary writer, specifically franchise vet Mutsubi Ito, Sora was written with slightly less IQ than the previous two episodes that were written by the head writer. She wasn't too much dumber, just a little insensitive to her partner's needs and ended up kind of ditching her. This led to the best gag of the episode, with Mashiro pushing away the chocobo with her awkwardness. Which doesn't make a whole lot of sense. I mean, come on, when have birds and rabbits ever been on bad terms and you knew that was coming? Anyway, another reason Sora needed to ditch her partner was to give her a moment with Shala, who assured her that she had made a full recovery, which as some of my comment section from last week pointed out, does feel a little suspicious. Back with Elle, she recapped her adventures with the Precure with pictures, which in of itself might be a bit of a callback to Masho's stint as a picture book author. <laughs> oh, they showed her the one actually good live action Transformers movie. Get lost. She also drew a picture of Yo-Yo, I'm guessing when she saw her one night when she was smoking some of the stuff she had her granddaughter get for her. Then of course the Precure themselves, which prompted her to do a budget version of their transformation without the actual toy, which I'm sure a lot of dads across Japan would appreciate. <laughs> Though interestingly, this triggered some kind of reaction within the little princess. Back with our protagonist, they partook in some of Skyland's local cuisine. <laughs> Oh what, is there something wrong with saying doll bone nut so okay, now I hear it. But yeah, this was another subtle callback to her previous outing, the Yakitai episode, except kind of the inverse with Masho and Agiha recognizing the subtle different taste of a similar looking food from their world. And this led to easily the best part of the episode, when the former acknowledged that they did indeed come from different worlds, and yet both their similarities and differences were what were connecting them. This is a very subtle yet effective scene showing how even simple cultural exchanges like sharing food can bring people together. And there are even more layers to it when you consider Masho is a quarter Skylandian, so for her it's pretty much her reconnecting with her cultural heritage after spending her whole life in a different one. TLDR, I prefer subtle cultural themes like this way more than Elemental's overly overt messaging. 
It's great stuff, even though lines like this are kind of adding to my ulcers with how overly happy they are for now. The king and queen requested an audience with our protagonist as they wanted to ask them to take their daughter with them back to Earth. They were of course confused by this very notion, especially after all the damn work they put into reuniting this family, but apparently fate had other plans. Well, I'm sure she'll get along with this kid. I mean, he has a bright future ahead of him, doesn't he? Actually, I'm not even that far off because apparently Ellsworth was also anything but natural, as instead some morning star had just given her to the royal couple one year earlier. Yeah, as it turned out, that nickname they had given her wasn't just a really forced reference to the most popular member of the Gold Princess team. And the star that had the voice of Neko Musume gave them the task of watching over Elle until the time would come when she would have to fulfill her destiny and all that jazz. Yeah, obviously, they're building towards Elle becoming the sixth ranger of this team, like myself and many others already predicted, just by the fact that a notable VA was voicing this toddler, and in fact, this would be the second Kaguya-sama VA to play a precure. Honestly, these are decent developments, even if they are a little cliched, but really, I'm more distracted by the fact that this king and queen seem to have no actual heirs. Like, are they just physically incapable of reproducing, or is this a British royal family situation? God, I hope not. But yeah, as a result, they had only really raised this adoptive kid for one year, and yet, even within that short amount of time, they did indeed become a family. In fact, this lucky little girl managed to make two families through a few adversities here and there. Seriously, all this stuff was just so goddamn wholesome, and yet I really do feel like things are gonna go really south later on. Hell, they just kept on raising some uneasy flags, like when Sora returned her pendant to Shala. Yeah, I think I'm just gonna keep you on this table right here, you know, just in case. Anyway, we're about 18 minutes into this episode, and yet no new evil general to replace Batamoda, or even just the dude himself again. So, is this episode even gonna have an antagonist? Oh, come now, that's just Nimbus prejudice. I mean, for all y'all know, those clouds could be there to serve a very important, yet also kind of screwy, climactic twist later. But yeah, no actual fights this week, just our characters using their superpowers to clear the weather for their parade. Riveting. Okay, but seriously, it doesn't bar me for reasons I'll explain just a bit in the closing thoughts. Anyway, the episode ended with Macho reiterating that they were indeed one big family. And no cameo cure this week, just instead arguably the spotlight character of this, as well as a birthday girl. This was uh, another one of those episodes that hopefully will have some great payoffs later. I mean, they're clearly planting seeds for some later developments, else pre gear debut is a painfully obvious one, but we also might get some other twists that will even fulfill my crackpot theories. And on its own, this is a nice enough cool down episode after the intensity of that last outing. If there's one general complaint I've had with this series so far, it would be its pacing. I mean, while it doesn't bar me quite as much as others, it's hard not to notice the lack of world building. Be it with Skyland, Elle's role, and especially the villains, who are still severely lacking in substance, like when was the last time we even heard Nightmare Moon talk? Thus, an episode like this that fully utilizes its time to tackle those first two points is greatly appreciated. While El turning out to be a divine being was very predictable, it was still good that they finally properly established this, and the twist that she wasn't the actual child of the infantile royal family was a good one, and it did make for a very touchy moment with them still recognizing her as their daughter. Meanwhile, the cultural exchange scene was a great bit of subtle storytelling and theming to really establish how this Precure team was from two different worlds. As a result, it's hard to really mind the fact that there was no actual conflict this week other than some MLP style weather management. Hell, depending on how future episodes play out, there might be some good foreshadowing here too. 
Again, I just can't trust when things are going this well, and Shala is still acting at least a little sus to me. That is something we'll have to confirm for another day. As for now, overall, this was a nice cooldown episode. Whatever future may lie ahead for this child of destiny, one thing is for sure is that it will lead to a sad outcome for the wallets of many Precure Daddies across Japan in a few months. In celebration of the All-Stars F film that's going to be celebrating this franchise's 20th anniversary, even though it's actually the 19th, we're going to be taking a look at a doji scene that celebrated this franchise's 10th anniversary, even though it was actually the 9th with Doki Doki. But yeah, a nice thing about comic reviews is that they're really easy to edit, so we should actually have a review up of this book sometime later this week. So do look forward to it. Until then though, farewell for now my friends, and uh, can I help you? Breathing is fun. Yes, I imagine it is.